This episode of Business Breakdowns is brought to you by Brex. Brex began as a corporate card for startups, but now offers an all-in-one solution to help you scale your business. Brex combines high-limit credit cards, spend controls, and accounting integrations into one platform. Brex is simplifying the process for founders and CFOs and quickly becoming the centralized tool for startup scaling. Just go to brex.com slash business breakdowns to get a corporate card with 10 to 20 times higher limits, rewards, built-in expense software, and no personal guarantee required. Brex business accounts let you send free wires anywhere and make easy deposits. Start now at brex.com slash business breakdowns and get up to 50,000 reward points. This episode is brought to you by MIT Investment Management Company, also known as Matimco. As the endowment office of MIT, Matimco searches for investment firms that are focused on achieving exceptional long-term investment returns. Matimco's goal is to create long-term relationships. They will partner with firms as early as day one and do not ask for general partner economics in return. Visit Matimco's website to learn more about their unconventional emerging manager approach, including examples of managers they have backed. While they only partner with a handful of new firms each year, they have also created and published resources for the broader universe of emerging managers to benefit from, making them even more unusual in the LP world. Matimco also opportunistically hires new members for their investment team. The Matimco team spends their time learning about great businesses and investments, working with exceptional investors around the world in order to support generations of MIT innovators. Visit matimco.org, M-I-T-I-M-C-O.org to learn more. Click join to learn more about the global investor role on Matimco's team and click emerging managers to learn more about their emerging manager activities. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts and podcast guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. I'm Zach Fuss, and today we're breaking down Next Era Energy. Next Era is America's most valuable energy firm and consists primarily of two businesses, a high-quality regulated utility and a renewables business that is the world's largest generator of wind and solar energy. To help break down the business, I'm joined by Mark Tomasovic, an investor at Energize VC. In our conversation, we discussed the structure of the energy market, what's changed in the renewable space over the past 20 years, and how NextEra takes advantage of its cost of capital advantage. Please enjoy this breakdown of NextEra Energy. Mark, thank you for joining us to break down NextEra. I thought a great place to start was if you tell us a little bit about yourself, just a level set, where you're coming from and how you think about the energy markets. Thanks, Zach. I'm an investor at Energize Ventures. Energize is an alternative asset manager. We're based in Chicago. We invest in digital technologies specific to energy and sustainable industry. Personally, my background is actually in the energy industry. And so at Energize, I'm always looking for new tech that can help heavy industry decarbonize and then broadly drive operational efficiencies. Great. So maybe just to start, given the energy markets are immense, broad, complex, if you could help us just to understand power and electricity and how the market is structured. Yeah, when we take a step back and we look at energy as a whole, energy as a whole in the U.S. is about a trillion dollar industry. So in perspective, the U.S. energy industry only consumes about 15% of the world's energy. So the market's massive. Quite literally, everything that we do each day requires energy, whether it's gasoline for our cars or turning on the lights at home. But I think what's more important is actually the breakdown of where that energy comes from. And today in the US, still about 80% of the energy that we consume comes from petroleum, natural gas, or coal. 10% comes from nuclear. And only 10% comes from renewable energy assets, things like solar, wind, hydropower, and biomass. So we're still very much in the first inning of renewable energy when looking at energy as a whole landscape. But then when we dig down into the different sources of energy and we take out things like gasoline and jet fuel and just look at the power sector in particular, power is still about a $500 billion industry by revenue and power, electricity, 
is still very early in its decarbonization efforts. So the U.S. uses about 400 gigawatts of electricity at any given time. About 60% of electricity that's generated is generated by the combustion of fossil fuels. 20% is generated by nuclear energy. And then 20% is generated by renewables, most of which is wind and solar. You look at the market in the context of how a consumer interacts with it, despite the fact that throughout the day we're using energy at our workplace, at home, in our automobiles. I know that at the end of every month, I receive an energy bill from anywhere from call it 150 to $400, depending upon where you live and how much electricity you're consuming. How does it get from its point of production to the consumer? And how are the businesses organized in order to do that? When it comes to electricity, there's four main pieces to the value chain. It's generation, transmission, distribution, and consumption. So generation is the actual plant that creates the electricity. Transmission are the transmission lines that move it across the country in high voltage. Distribution is the movement of the electricity to the consumers. And then consumption is obviously consuming the electricity in your homes or businesses. And for the last 100 years, actually, electricity has been built and operated in roughly the same way. So a coal-fired or gas-fired power plant would generate the electricity in one central location, and then transmission lines would transmit that electricity across the country to homes or businesses. What's happening now, though, is actually this landscape is fundamentally changing. Broadly, these energy assets are moving from centralized coal-fired or gas-fired power plants to decentralized wind turbines and solar panels. And Energize, we like to say, generation is becoming more and more distributed. And so what this is creating is new challenges in the way that we transmit, distribute, and even consume energy as more people even begin generating energy on their rooftops at home with solar panels. And so if I think about energy as an analyst, it's my understanding that effectively there's a hurdle or a limit to the return on equity that an energy company can realize. I imagine that has something to do with the regulated and unregulated markets. But what is it that informs the amount that an energy company is allowed to quote unquote earn? What's interesting about US infrastructure is that the grid is not connected. And there's different markets depending on the different regions of the US. So for example, there's a different grid or a different market in Pennsylvania than there is for Texas. And these grids or these markets can actually be regulated or deregulated. Much of the Southeast, the Northwest, the West, these are regulated markets where an electric utility actually generates or procures the electricity for their retail customers. And those utilities are typically vertically integrated monopolies, and they're regulated by the local or national organizations in those markets. The way that these regulated utilities makes money is the regulator actually dictates the return that the utility can generate. So the regulator will essentially allow the utility to charge an electricity price so that the utility can generate, say, a 10% return on their assets after depreciation and expenses. And what this creates, is, you can imagine, it creates a strong bias for the utility to heavily invest in new power plants, heavily invest in upgrading the grid, because they're guaranteed to make that 10% on every new asset that they build. So that's the utility business model. That's in regulated markets. And then that model will become especially important as we begin to talk about Nextera, because part of their business is a regulated utility. The other model is deregulated markets, which is Texas and actually most of the Northeast. And in these deregulated markets, market participants can also compete. So the utility company is still around, and it makes sure that the power is distributed and everything is working correctly. But in these deregulated markets, other companies can generate the electricity, they can sell into wholesale markets. And then retail energy suppliers can actually purchase the electricity and sell it directly to consumers. In these markets, there's one independent organization which will manage the grid, and the customer can choose who they want to buy their electricity from. To spend a little bit more time on unregulated versus regulated markets for electricity, I'm just thinking back to the energy crisis in Texas earlier this year. Generally, how do state and local governments think about whether their markets should be regulated and unregulated? And what are kind of the risks and benefits of having it that way? A lot of it is just dependent on local legislation. So each market has what's called a public utility commission that dictates the rules within that market. So a lot of it is dependent on who is appointed to run those organizations. And then you have an overall national organization called FERC, which basically manages it on the national level. 
But when you think about what happened in Texas, essentially the grid was not designed to operate in those winter conditions. Texas is a deregulated market. And when the Texas freeze occurred, everything froze. So wind turbines froze, gas plants froze, coal piles froze, and it wasn't particularly sunny out. And so what happened was during the Texas freeze, generation essentially shut down and demand went through the roof. So that created this supply demand imbalance where these retail energy providers, because it's a deregulated market and customers can choose a particular retail energy provider to supply their electricity, well, those retail energy providers have to purchase essentially from the wholesale markets or even from the spot markets to provide that electricity to the individual customer. And they're required to supply that electricity at a specific price to the customer. And so what happened is you saw a lot of those retail energy providers get punished pretty badly because they had to go out and procure electricity at extremely high prices and then go ahead and provide that electricity to the individual at a much lower price. So that's why, for instance, we saw a lot of the reps in Texas really go under during that time because ultimately demand went through the roof and supply completely plummeted. If we can kind of talk a little bit about the evolution of the source materials or the feedstock that have been used and what the landscape looks like today. Obviously, the energy markets were dominated by coal for a long time, but that's no longer the case. With the advent and the proliferation of fracking, natural gas became a lot more relevant. What does it look like today when I think about the retail electric market? If we look back about 20 years, there was virtually no solar or wind capacity in the U.S., So the country was primarily powered by coal, natural gas, nuclear, and hydropower. But since then, the cost of solar and wind have dramatically declined, which has actually made these new energy technologies competitive with fossil fuels. So in the last decade alone, solar has declined in cost by 90%, and wind has declined in cost by 70%. And so now the cost of solar and wind are in many geographies cheaper than coal, natural gas, and nuclear power. And so when we look at U.S. utility-scale generation as a whole, today, about 60% of the electricity is generated by the combustion of natural gas and coal, primarily, and then 20% is nuclear, and 20% is renewable energy. So that's a fantastic segue and gives us the basis of information to better understand the energy markets. Now, I'd love to spend some time digging into the topic of NextEra. Surprisingly, it's the largest utility by market cap in the U.S., sporting, I believe, $235 billion enterprise value and $170 billion market cap, a huge business that I don't think is well understood or appreciated. Can you just help us to better understand the basics of the business, how it's organized, its history, and then we'll dive a bit deeper into the economics of it? So Nextera is actually the largest generator of solar and wind energy in the world as well. And I think before we get into the details of Nextera, it's really important to start with their history because it frames how they've evolved as a business to have one part of their business being a regulated utility and then the other part of their business being a renewable energy generator. And when you look at kind of how NextEra was founded, in the very beginning, it was actually founded as a utility holding company in the 1920s called American Power and Light. And American Power and Light would go around Florida acquiring various electric utilities. And this was actually a pretty relatively common practice. So by the 1930s, there was eight of these utility holding companies in the U.S., and they controlled almost 75% of the electric industry in the U.S. They're highly levered, and they were actually difficult for states to regulate. So then in the 1930s, one electric holding utility called Middle West Utility went bankrupt, which was actually disastrous to small investors and employees across the East and the Midwest. And so in 1935, Roosevelt came and rolled out a new regulation to break up these utility holding companies. And the companies were forced to divest so that each became a single integrated monopoly. And those integrated monopolies became known as today's utilities. Fast forward 15 years, in 1950, because of the act, American Power and Light divest their Florida utility, which became Florida Power and Light, and Florida Power and Light became the utility arm of NextEra. Great. So... Fast forwarding to today, Nextera is primarily organized into two somewhat distinct entities. Can you help us to understand what the difference is in those two business lines? So Nextera 
the two businesses are the regulated utility, which is primarily Florida Power and Light. And then they have a fast growing renewable energy business called Nextera Energy Resources. The utility business is a regulated utility and they do everything vertically integrated across generation, transmission, distribution, and then sale of the energy to retail customers in Florida. And they serve about 10 million people in Southeast Florida. And then they also recently acquired a company, another utility called Gulf Power to service more customers in Northwest Florida. Their business is largely protected from competition because of regulation, but they're actually one of the country's most well-run utilities. They've consistently reduced their electricity prices for their consumer. They're one of the most reliable utilities actually in the U.S. They've become extremely good at responding to hurricanes, frankly, just keeping the lights on. And essentially, you can think of that as Nextera's regulated cash cow side of the business. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about the regulated utility cash cow part of the business. I thought it was very interesting that you noted that they're one of the low cost providers. How is it that a utility can be low cost in that manner in that what are the inputs and costs associated with running that business that allow them to do it in such efficient manner? Yeah, well, this actually goes back to their history as well. So Right after World War II, when Florida Power and Light was divested by American Power and Light, Florida's population took off quickly after World War II. As the market in Florida began to grow, so did Florida Power and Light. But Florida Power and Light was struggling to keep up with the growth in the market. And they were experiencing power blackouts and grid failures. And they were actually one of the least reliable U.S. electric utilities at the time. One, because they were trying to keep up with demand. And then two, because they operate in part of the country that's particularly exposed to hurricanes. But then in the late 1980s, management got together and they said, we need to change. We can't keep operating like this. And the company moved to a Japanese-inspired style of management where they really stressed quality control. So they improved operator rounds. They added plant management. They really stressed equipment uptime. And what that allowed them to do was cut service outages in half. They decreased injuries on their job sites. And they added about 100,000 customers a year all without increasing the price of their electricity. So it really all revolves around this quality control standard that they implemented in the late 1980s. How does that low cost structure help them financially? Well, utilities are the only business where the company P&L is actually built from the bottom up. So first, the regulator assigns a utility an allowed rate of return. Next, that allowed rate of return is multiplied by the asset base of the utility to get the utility's bottom line profitability. Then expenses are added And then finally, the sum of the expenses and profitability becomes that top line revenue that the utility can generate by charging their customers. In this equation, technically, yeah, the utility can pass through its expenses to its customers and then charge the customers a higher electricity price to make up for the expenses. But they actually don't want to do this in practice because if the utility keeps its OPEX low, then it can keep its electricity prices low, which makes the customers happy and even makes the regulator happy. And then second, If the utility cuts OPEX, the utility can often work out a deal with the regulator where they split the savings, and then the utility can actually earn more than their allowed rate of return. So overall, it's just beneficial for everyone if the utility keeps OPEX low. Great. So that's Florida Power and Light, which is the, in your words, cash cow of the business. Now the more exciting growth engine of the business being NEER. Take us through that business. NEER is Nextera Energy Resources, which is the world's largest generator of wind and solar. Nextera Energy Resources is primarily focused on the development, construction, and then operation of long-term contracted renewable power assets throughout the U.S. and Canada. They focus on the wholesale competitive energy markets. They have about 24 gigawatts of total generating capacity. And in the last three years, about 85% of their revenue was generated by selling into long-term committed contracts such as power purchase agreements, rather than short-term bilateral contracts. So really, their goal is to find locations in the U.S. that have high renewable resource capacity, sunny locations, windy locations, develop renewable energy assets there, and then sell the renewable energy through long-term contracts to some of these major off-takers in the wholesale markets. So what would be an example of some of those off-takers? Every day, actually, big tech firms, for example, become some of these off-takers. Companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Walmart even want to purchase and procure renewable energy 
and they want to do it through long-term contracts called PPAs or power purchase agreements. And so are they committing to volume, price, term? How do those contracts kind of work? Just trying to better understand how the renewables business within Nextera is able to get these strong contracts. All of the above. So they're committing to primarily price and volume over a certain time period. They can either be sold through the wholesale markets, which are through those independent system operators that I talked about that manage the grid, or typically you can actually uh, contract outside of those wholesale markets and form a direct relationship with a big customer, maybe Amazon or Walmart or someone like that directly. And so if I look at the two business units, FPL and NEER, how does the size on a revenue basis and on an earnings basis kind of compare? Yeah, so the whole company does about $18 billion in revenue next year as a whole. Florida Power & Light does about $12 billion in revenue with about 30% operating income, 20% net income. And then Next Era Energy Resources is about half that. So they do about $5 billion in revenue and their net income is about 10%, but it's a little more volatile depending on various impairment charges on some investments that they've made. It's a little bit more of a, I guess, a higher risk, higher return based on prospecting for new resources and developing new assets. So it seems really unique to me that the business has a regulated arm and an unregulated arm. And the way you talked about the virtues of the way that all of them work together is very intuitive. But I don't get the sense that that's how all the energy companies are organized. Why is that? Well, there certainly are peer play developers and peer play regulated utilities, and those are common. But there actually have been a few others that have attempted this fully vertically integrated strategy and actually failed attempting it. And for the ones that failed, where they went wrong was they made massive bets on very capital intensive energy assets like nuclear and their deregulated arms. And these nuclear plants went underwater because wind and solar which are relatively modular and less capital intensive, were able to enter the market and were so cheap that they compressed the merchant power prices. And so a lot of these companies that attempted the fully integrated strategy just chose the wrong type of energy assets in their deregulated division. And if you're going to pursue Nextera's strategy, you have to be right about the future of energy. And ultimately, Nextera was able to succeed because they were very early on renewables. And when you guys are looking at renewables businesses like Nextera, how do you think about gross margins, returns on capital, operating margins? What is the benchmark that's most important to you guys? I would say Nextera has one of the highest margins in the industry, primarily because it's basically that split between the regulated utility and the high growth renewable energy opportunity. They also actually have a yield co within the business that provides a regular dividend to their investors and actually purchases renewable energy assets from NEER. And so that becomes even more attractive because then when NextEra Energy Resources develops an asset, it can essentially immediately sell that to their yield co. You know, that can provide liquidity for that asset. And then the yield co will continue to provide a dividend and actually increase its dividend as it purchases more assets from NEER. I would say when you look at Nextera as a whole, it's delivered a shareholder return of like 230% over the last five years, which is about double the S&P 500's return, it's triple the S&P utilities return, and triple the Dow Jones electricity index return. So it's really this pretty amazing one-two punch of we have this regulated utility cash cow that's generating roughly a 10% return on equity because of the way that the regulation is structured. And then we can reinvest that cash into our high growth renewable developer, NER. And then if we need to sell those renewable projects, well, then we have this yield co that can purchase those renewable projects and then provide a dividend to the yield co investor. So it's a really, really interesting structure that provides a lot of different kind of levers to pull when you think about both generating cash and reinvesting into a high growth industry like renewables. And so in a world where ESG is kind of dominating the narrative in terms of fund flows, do they have a natural cost of capital advantage that they're able to use in developing these projects? Absolutely. I think when you look at energy as a whole right now, look at the capital providers that finance these mega infrastructure projects, 
there's certainly a, a cost of capital advantage to being a renewable energy developer. Right now, cost of capital is one of the major prohibitors to new hydrocarbon production projects. Whereas in the renewable energy industry, cost of capital can be as low as 3%. And so a lot of money is interested in moving into the space. And I think the fact that Nextera is both a very reliable developer, the largest developer, and has provided extremely strong returns to shareholders, really decrease its cost of capital and allow investors or create more willingness for investors to invest into the company. So if you look back at the last decade of energy development in the US, fracking has kind of been a dominant narrative, which has led to a massive supply of natural gas. Given what's going on in the COVID crisis and the lack of new exploration, how does that play into the energy and electric grid and our source of cheap electricity in this country? So right now, there's less drilling than there was a few years ago. There's a few different reasons to that. One being, in general, the world is moving more towards a lower carbon mindset, I guess you could say. And that's from the regulator side, potentially making it more difficult to access these drilling permits. And then, like I said earlier, cost of capital is increasing for hydrocarbon projects from the investor side. And then also, over the last two decades, a lot of these hydrocarbon producers or oil and gas producers got over their skis and they started essentially basically drilling in locations specifically in West Texas that might not have been as economic as they originally planned. And what essentially happened there was a lot of the producers began chasing new production instead of chasing cash flow. And so they were always focused on drilling the next well, not necessarily focused on limiting CapEx and returning cash to their investors. And so unfortunately, it's been a really difficult time over the last two decades to invest in oil and gas projects because there wasn't very much of a focus on cash flow and actually providing returns to shareholders. Everything was focused on growing production, growing production. And the reason why I bring that up is because now, after the last two decades, the actual oil and gas operators themselves have decided to focus on cash flow. So they've essentially almost learned their lesson and they've said, okay, now we're going to slow down drilling. We're going to slow down investment in CapEx and we're going to start providing a dividend to our investors or slowing things down on the production standpoint because they've learned their lesson over the last two decades. So it's kind of this three-pronged attitude, I guess you could say, from the regulator becoming more ESG focused, the investor having less of an appetite for hydrocarbon projects, and then the operators themselves slowing production because they want to focus more on free cash flow rather than on production. So comparatively for a business like Nextera, it sounds like what you're saying is energy prices potentially are going to be higher for longer in the US, at least in the near term. They've historically produced, I think, 60% of their energy from wind, 25% from nuclear and the rest solar and natural gas. What does that mean as a competitive advantage to them in a world where on a relative basis, conventional forms of energy production are now more expensive? I do think that energy prices broadly, especially when you talk about hydrocarbon-based energy, will be higher, at least in the near term, because of those three effects that we talked about. Energy prices for renewables, we've actually seen become relatively low based on the way that renewables are bid into the wholesale markets. And the reason that is, is because right now, renewables, primarily the resource, the solar and the wind, are in locations that are less population dense. So locations like the middle of the country, for example, whereas most of the population in the country lives on the coast. So when it comes to renewables, there's actually situations in which energy prices can get very low or even negative because the resource is not necessarily where the people are. And so now there's actually a big push with these renewable energy developers to build out transmission so that you can transmit the electricity from the middle of the country to the coast so that you can have a better supply-demand balance 
But right now, I would say that hydrocarbon-based electricity or hydrocarbon-based energy will see, at least in the short term, increase in prices. But renewable energy can stay very low because the resource is not necessarily where the people are. So one of the things that kind of stand out to me in the renewable space is the benefit of government programs and subsidies. How reliant is this business on government subsidies and to what extent does it benefit them? In certain geographies, solar and wind are actually competitive with coal and natural gas on an unsubsidized basis. But the renewable energy industry does certainly still take advantage of government subsidies. For instance, they take advantage of accelerated depreciation. There's things called production tax credits for wind and investment tax credits for solar. They can get a tax credit based on the cost of developing the asset or the amount of electricity produced. And then overall, there's broadly green mandates from states that make it more attractive to develop renewable energy in those states. And so that's where Nextera can really have a competitive advantage because it is currently the world's best-in-class renewable energy developer. It really kind of adds that additional tailwind to broadly just increase the number of renewable energy assets deployed. And so it's an interesting juxtaposition as you talked about the discipline that a lot of the energy companies are now finding on capital allocation and that they're going to return cash to shareholders in lieu of spending. Next era is a bit different in that it's one of the largest capital investors in the US. I think they're going to do about $15 billion in CapEx. Where's all that money being spent? Primarily on the development of wind in the middle of the country, and then the development of transmission lines. So there's a big push in how can we get that wind power from the middle of the country distributed out into the coast. And so can you help just better contextualize how expensive some of these projects can be and how investors think about the return on that investment? Depending on the size of the project, it can be $500 million to a $1 billion wind farm or solar farm in the U.S. And A lot of these projects, they're financed with high amounts of debt because especially if you have an offtake agreement that's a long-term contract, you can become more comfortable that there's a power purchase agreement in place to sell your electricity for an extended period of time, generally over a couple of years. And so you can finance these things with potentially 70% debt, 30% equity. And then you can think of cost of capital there being in the single digits and then the investment the expected return on those projects also being probably high single digits, I would say. It depends on the location. It depends on the power purchase agreement. But I would say generally, you can think of probably the return on these investments being in the high single digits. Got it. How do you go about valuing these opportunities as they cross your desk? It seems to be a business where you have a good visibility on earnings, but are there payback periods or project return thresholds or something else that you can use as a benchmark for, for evaluation? Well, when we think about renewable projects in general, we look at two things, unlevered returns and levered returns. And we look at those returns over two time periods. The first being the expected life of the project. And then the second is the contract period for the power purchase agreement with potential customer. The life of a wind project can be about 30 years, but actually nowadays due to competition, these power purchase agreements with the customers may only be about 10 years. So in general, it's great if the project can pay back within that power purchase agreement time period. So within that contracted 10-year time period where you have that guaranteed offtake. And then over the lifetime of the project, we usually like to see unlevered returns of about 5 to 7% and then levered returns in the high single digits, low double digits. And then when we think about valuing utility companies as a whole, we usually look at things like EPS growth, PE ratio, dividend yield, And for example, usually utilities will see about 5% EPS growth per year and have a dividend yield of about 4%. Anything greater than that is really good. I look at the amount of growth that the business is driving. We had called a clean energy cycle not all that long ago that did not end particularly well for both investors and operators. What is different about the renewable energy space this time around where look back at Sun Edison, which was a very prominent bankruptcy Is there something structurally different about these businesses? Yeah. Well, first of all, the cost of renewable power has declined primarily because the cost of the hardware has declined. So just a decade ago, or since a decade ago, 
the decline in solar hardware has been 90%. And then wind hardware has declined by 70%. And actually battery hardware has declined by 95%. So first of all, the hardware itself has actually declined where it's now competitive with these other forms of energy, whether it be coal or natural gas or nuclear. So that's the first point there. The second would be electricity demand in in the U.S. is actually expected to grow. And that's because now everything is electrifying. It's part of the ESG movement as well. So whether it's your car becoming electric, whether it's your stove becoming electric, maybe home heating and cooling, everything is becoming more and more electric. So electricity demand in the U.S. is actually expected to grow by 30% in the next 30 years. And then the third part, think back to the utility business model. Capital investment is how utilities make their money. They don't essentially make their money on cutting operating costs. And if you think about solar and wind, well, solar and wind are primarily capital investments. They have low maintenance costs. Fuel is free. And so now that the cost of solar and wind has declined to the point where the hardware itself is competitive with a coal-fired power plant or a natural gas-fired power plant, these utilities can make a lot of money by embracing renewables because they make their money off capital investment and not by cutting operating costs. And so everything we've kind of laid out here in regards to this business has been overwhelmingly positive. You have this amazing cash cow in the Florida business. You've got a renewables business that's growing at a very healthy clip with long-term contracts. But of course, no business is without risks. If something were to go wrong here, what do you think it is that would potentially hinder this business? First of all, supply chain is probably the biggest concern. So manufacturing capacity is heavily concentrated in China, especially when it comes to solar panels. So any sort of supply chain dislocations are heavily concentrated. And then when we think about what goes into solar panels, these minerals and these rare earth elements, the cost of them should skyrocket, especially as electric vehicle demand increases. So we could potentially see a commodity super cycle in the near term where the cost of what goes into these renewable energy assets skyrockets. The second, actually, construction labor resources are a real concern. So robotics and and automation will help. But in reality, we need a ton of skilled labor to build these assets, especially in locations like the middle of the country where the resources actually are. And then I think there actually is a risk of similar to the shale revolution 2000s and 2010s, there's a risk of these renewable energy developers getting over their skis. So when oil prices were high, And these shale operators chased production instead of cash flow. Companies thought it was a literal land grab and they were paying incredible prices for acreage. They really, they got over their skis. And I think there could be potentially a similar situation here where renewable energy developers find an area that might be particularly windy or particularly sunny, overestimate the amount of resource in that acreage. And it could provide a similar framework for what happened to shale gas in the late 2000s, where the companies chase production, invest too much in CapEx and too much in new projects and stop focusing on cash flow. When I look across wind, solar, and nuclear, how do you guys think about how long-lived these assets are? One of the knocks on solar is eventually the panels need to be replaced and recycled on wind that the turbines break down. When you guys are underwriting investments in these areas of the market, how do you kind of consider those risks? Yeah, broadly 40 plus years for any of these plants. And I would actually say that these plants are the most reliable form of energy generation. It's still very early, I would say, in the deployment of these assets. The industry as a whole is still trying to figure out, okay, how often do we need to replace solar panels or how often do we need to do a certain type of maintenance to our wind turbines. But broadly, these are multi-decade investments. And then I guess, would nuclear be a potential tail risk to a business like this? Or is it a benefit to them? Should there be increased adoption? Nextera actually has a few nuclear power plants. And they actually, through Florida Power and Light, and actually 22% of Florida Power and Light's production is nuclear electricity production. So they are exposed to nuclear. The issue with nuclear right now is just that it's frankly expensive to build when compared to wind and solar assets. So going back to the fact that solar has decreased in price and wind has decreased in price, nuclear has actually increased 
in price over the last decade. When you look at all of the different plants that you could potentially build if you're a utility, frankly, right now, it just makes the most sense to build a renewable power plant versus a nuclear power plant. Energy is historically viewed as a commodity business and such that the multiples are never so high and the returns on capital relatively tight to cost of capital. And I imagine there are ways that you can find competitive advantages, whether that be differentiated sourcing, process power, technology. How does this business operate in a way that allows them to earn an above average return despite operating in the commodity industry? Well, Nextera is actually one of the most forward-leaning companies when it comes to the adoption of digital technologies in particular. And this has made them actually increase their reliability, decrease their power outages, decrease their safety events, and really embrace this opportunity as being the low-cost, high-reliability power producer. And the way that they've done that is they've started to deploy new technologies, such as smart meters, outage detection, other grid technologies that help them recover from Florida hurricanes. Nextera as a whole has really leaned into the digitization of energy and has made them a much more reliable power producer and able to service 10 million customers at the lowest cost. And so through your evaluation of both this business and all the energy and renewable businesses that you guys look at, what are some lessons you take away from this story that can be applied for investors and then also for practitioners and operators? What is it about the next era story that you think could be borrowed and applied in building other businesses? Yeah, first of all, so Nextera has been able to access capital at an extremely low cost of capital because they have an investment grade balance sheet from the utility business being such a cash cow. They have the scale advantage, which allows them to buy, build, and operate cheaper all across the country because they have the best in class supply chain relationships. And then because they have this low cost, high reliability model, this puts them in good graces politically and with the regulators. So when the regulator is determining the return on equity that that utility can generate, the regulator will be more favorable to Nextera or to Florida Power and Light because they're known as a very high reliability, very low power outage, very safe organization. And then when we think about it from an investment standpoint, well, renewables are going to at least 4x in solid capacity in the next 20 to 30 years. And so we're really just at the beginning of this renewable energy deployment. And so I think for investors, just find out a way to get exposure to some of these industries in the renewable energy production, and then also find derivative industries that are related to the build out of these assets. And then finally, because Nextera is such an adopter of digital technologies, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the digital aspect of the energy transition. So now that solar and wind have decreased so far in costs, what remains are the soft costs associated with the engineering, accounting, finance, and procurement of these solar and wind assets. And those soft costs can be solved by digital technologies like software. And so that's where Energize Ventures focuses is investing in the software layer of renewable energy assets to help the renewable energy industry grow and scale. Great. This has been a truly educational study of Nextera and the energy industry. Mark, we appreciate you taking the time to help us to break down this business. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Zach. I appreciate it. To find more episodes of breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S.com. 